everyone, this is Stephen Sapel, Legal Ordained Reverend inside Church. I'm also a chaplain for Church, a priest for Church. I'm also a preceptor of Church. I'm also a preacher, ooh la la. I'm also a padre, a father, an honorary Bible historian. And of course, I have an honorary doctorate in ministry, metaphysics, divinity, and humanitarianism. I'm also an honorary professor of theology. And I'm also an ordained minister with Universal, Universal Ministries. And of course, I am a... Lord Knight of the First Order of the Holy Order of Saints. Now that I got that out of the way, let's get started with us. So a reading from the book from the prophet of I Isaiah. So yes, starting with the sacraments. So this is going to be the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3a. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to comfort all who mourn. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord, and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a datum instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. This is the word of the Lord. With everything that is happening right now here in the world, here in the U.S. especially, so with the mass shootings as of past number of weeks, my heart goes out to you, the victim's family, that God heals their hearts, and that God, again, heals their hearts and brings comfort and healing and the love and peace that they need. And, of course, with the ongoing Ukraine war and with the Israel-Gaza conflict, at least a ceasefire is an attentive deal at the stages right now, but Israel will continue its war after that ceasefire time ends. So as much as, so all the blood and death and everything else we've witnessed this past six weeks, war will continue. So the ceasefire well, pretty much the majority of, of everyone who loves humans and who desires the safeguarding of human life is for the ceasefire, but the ceasefire is only temporary. And again, as I've previously stated in past videos, sermons, and posts, again, with both sides believing they are right to obliterate the other side. So both, which is why Hamas needs to be opposed, but so does the state of Israel, with ethnic cleansing and genocide that is well documented, both parties. <clears throat> so, and with the holiday season about to start, especially in the U.S. with Thanksgiving happening in a couple of days. So first and foremost, everyone stay safe and cherish this time with your loved ones. Cherish the time with family. Because again, time on this earth is very limited. So on that note, I'm going to switch stances. And I was actually going to do that. So, I'm going to continue reading from Sacrament. So, he bore our sufferings. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond that of man, and so his appearance beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Because of him, kings shall stand speechless. For those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe that we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoe from the parched earth, that was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him. No appearance that would attract us to him. He was burned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom men hide their faces, burned, and yet we held him in no esteem. Yet it was for our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of them as stricken, 
as was smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was he chastised that makes us whole. By his strength we are healed. We had gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shears. He was silent and not opened his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living, and spent by the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him, him among the wicked in a burial place with the evildoers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore I will make him his portion among the great. He shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was cowed among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many, and with the pardon of their offenses. This is the word of the Lord. And through Jesus Christ our Lord, whom God sent, his only begotten Son, to die so that we might live through him. Again, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loved us first. When sin came upon this earth, God made the way for our salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, through the best pot of God that God himself created. Again, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, so God's presence. So God sent his best part of himself to die for us. And through him, we, all our children of God, all brothers and sisters, through Christ Jesus our brother. <clears throat> and of course, we have to actually follow Jesus, his ways, his tenets, his testaments, to have the Holy Spirit in us, first and foremost. Because through Christ, through Jesus' sanctification, through Christ's sanctification, through the Holy Spirit, which he gives us, can we obtain this. And through that, again, can we be saved, of course, through Christ's sanctification. So we actually have to live by Christ's ways. We have to love, first and foremost, because God himself is love. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Why God is love. And why we have to be of love, period. And so with the holiday season upon us, with things being hectic, with travel plans and everything else, again, why family in our time with our loved ones is very, very important. Everything that is happening, I will also talk about. So to start this off, I'm going to read... 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 21. Of course, so imagine this day. So, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God. For he who does not love does not know God, because for God is love. Again, God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest towards us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and set us in the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and he, his love has been perfected in us. In my last sermon, I talked about 1 John chapter 4, well, 1 John chapter 3, for that matter, specifically, in the fact that if we do not have love for others, if we have hatred in our hearts, we are murdering others. But not only that, because of that hatred, we are not of the light. <clears throat> because we are of darkness. 
because of that hatred, because hatred is separation from God. So, again, no one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the, that the Father sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. For we have known and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, so hates anyone in general, any single human, for that matter. So if someone says, I love God, and hates anyone, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he can see, how can he love God, whom he cannot, has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must also love his brother. And I'm going to close that with that. And, and I'm going to switch to... Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Ethics. Specifically, love. Chapter, if I can find it this time. Like last time I... That this was basically a wild goose chase. So, love at page 51 through 56. Here we go. So, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Ethics. A good read. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Ethics, he talks about the ethical nature that we Christians have to take in this fallen world, especially confronting the evils in our days. Like in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's case, him confronting and combating the Nazi state. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my favorite theologians, and of course he was martyred for standing against that evil. So, love. And though I have the... No. Oh, I was just about to say, before I actually start reading this, let me actually switch to that verse that they're about to talk about. So, 1 Corinthians... Chapter 13. Verses 1. Okay, so verses 1 through 13. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and the understanding of all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can move mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be born, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, there will fail. There, where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know and in part, and we prophesy in part. But with that which is perfect has come, then that which is part has done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and stood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul states that if he could have all power, all prophecy, as to move mountains with a word, with a thought, but if he didn't have love, he was nothing. If he sacrificed himself, did good works for the whole entire world, it would profit him nothing if he had not love. Again, God is love. 
And we, as Christians, have to be of love. We have to abide in love to be of God and be used by God, of course, but we have to be of love to have <clears throat> God within us. Because again, God is love. If you want to have the Holy Spirit, again, of course, the tool that I use, for, especially when dealing, doing exorcism, for that matter, when having to ascertain if the person has the Holy Spirit in them or not, is a very simple one. Of course, I have to observe people a lot, but that's beside the point. Again, the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. <clears throat> if the person does not exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in their daily life, the Holy Spirit isn't in them. This I state outright. When a person doesn't have the Holy Spirit inside them, when the Holy Spirit is muted in the individual, something else enters and takes up residence, takes up claim of them, sets up shop. And this is why the understanding of when a person doesn't have any love inside of them, when they live a life that is contrary to love, this is why they have spiritual evils. This is why they end up being a demoniac. Because they do not have the Holy Spirit. You have to have, you have to be of love. You have to love others. Because again, love comes from grace. It is re much reduced in those who do not know Christ and even more so than the, those who know him but choose not to follow him. A choice that seems a serious sin. Of course, I'm paraphrasing Father Gabriel Amaroth, but his statement is those who do not <clears throat> have love are not of Christ. No matter if they profess to be a Christian or not. If they are, ha are hatred towards others, they do not have love in their hearts. If they do not have love in their hearts, they are not of God, period, no matter what they profess. So, now getting back to this point. Again, love is patient, love is kind, love is enduring. Against love, of course, does no wrong to others. So, before I get a little bit further in this, let's take a quick look at... I actually have this right here. So, there we go. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love's the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Again, in that passage right there, this is how sin is defined outside of the sin of lust. Harm of others. So regardless if it's the thought or the deed, the harm of others is sin. So you, as a Christian, you have to, again, as Romans chapter 13, 8 through 10, you have to love others. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And as a Christian, there is no limit to who your neighbor is, because every single human is your brother, it says, of course, God's promise to Abraham's shield and coming with Jesus Christ, our Lord. So... And, on that note, let me read another passage. So, Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. And behold, a man came upon him to saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you in your life keep the commandments, he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So again, love your neighbor, love those around you. Do no harm towards others. This is what it means to be of Christ. If you cannot do this, again, no matter what you profess, 
the love of Christ is not in you, the Spirit of God, the light of the Lord, is not in you. Because God is love. <clears throat> now that I took that out of the way, let's continue. So, page 56. Page 58 through 56. Okay, love. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. And this is the decisive word which marks the distinction between man in the disunion and man in the origin. The word is love. There is a recognition of Christ, a powerful faith in Christ indeed, a conviction and a devotion of love even unto death, all without love. That is the point. Without this love, everything falls apart and everything is unacceptable. But in this love, everything is united and everything is pleasing to God. What is this love? Everything that I've seen so far to, true, to be true excludes all those definitions which endeavor to represent the essence of love as a human attitude, a, as a conviction, devotion, and sacrifice, the will to fellowship, feeling, brotherhood, service, or action. All these without exception can, as we have just heard, arise without love. Everything that we are accustomed to call love, that which lives in the depths of the soul and in the visible deed, and even the brotherly service of one's neighbor, which proceeds from a pious heart, all this can be without love, not because there is always a residue of selfishness in all human conduct entirely overshadowing love, but because love as a whole is something entirely different from that which the word designates here. Nor is love the direct relationship between persons, the acceptance of the personal and individual in contrast to the law of the objective and impersonal institution. Quite apart from this thoroughly unbiblical and abstract wrenching apart of the personal objective or real love, here becomes an attitude of man, and only a partial one at that. Love now becomes a superior ethos of the personal, which perfects and completes the inferior ethos of the purely real and institutional. It is, for example, in accordance with this view, that one regards love and truth as mutually conflicting and gives priority to love as a personal principle over truth as an impersonal principle, thereby coming into direct contradiction with St. Paul saying that love rejoices in the truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6. For indeed love knows nothing of the very conflict in terms in which one seeks to define it. On the contrary, it is the essence of love which should lie beyond all disunion. A love which violates or even merely neutralizes truth is called by Luther with its clear biblical vision and a cursed love, even though it may present itself in the most pious dress, a love which embraces only the sphere of personal human relationships and which it capitulates before the objective and real can never be of the love of the New Testament. <clears throat> if then there is no conceivable human attitude or conduct which, as such, can unequivocally be designated by the name of love, if love lies beyond all the disunion in which man lives, and at the same time anything that men can understand and practice this love is conceivable only as human conduct within this actual disunion, then it is an enigma and an open question what else the Bible can mean by love. The Bible does not fail to give us the answer. We know this answer well enough, but we continually misinterpret it. It is this. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Again, God is love. First of all, for the sake of clarity, this sudden is to be read with the emphasis on the word God, whereas we fall into the habit of emphasizing the word love. God is love, and that is to say not a human attitude, a conviction, or a deed, but God, he himself, is love. Only he who knows God knows what love is, it is not the other way around. It is not that we first, by nature, know what love is and therefore know also what God is. No one knows God unless God reveals himself to him. Again, no one knows God unless God reveals himself to him. And again, God, he himself, is love. And no one knows what love is except in the self-revelation of God. Love, then, is a revelation of God, and the revelation of God is Jesus Christ. 
In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son in the world, that we might live through him. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9. God's revelation in Jesus Christ, God's revelation of his love, precedes all our love towards him. Love has its origin not in us, but in God. Love is not an attitude of men, but an attitude of God. So here's the reminder. Love is not an attitude of men, but an attitude of God. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. Only in Jesus Christ do we know what love is, namely in his deed for us. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And even here there is a given, no general definition of love in the sense, for example, it is a bearing, the laying down of one's life for the lives of others. What is here called love is not this general principle, but the utterly unique event of the laying down of a life of Jesus Christ for us. Love is inseparably bound up with the name of Jesus Christ as the revelation of God. The New Testament answers the question, what is love? Quite unambiguously, by pointing solely and entirely to Jesus Christ. He is the only definition of love. But again, it would be a complete misunderstanding if we were to derive a general definition of love from our view of Jesus Christ and of his deed and his suffering. Love is not what he does and what he suffers, but it is what he does and what he suffers. Love is always he himself. Love is always God himself. Love is always a revelation to God in Jesus Christ. When all our ideas and principles relating to love are concentrated in the strictest possible manner upon the name of Jesus Christ, and this must, above all, not be allowed to reduce this name to the mere abstract concept. This name must always be understood in the full concrete significance of the historical reality of a living man. And so, without any way contradicting what has been said so far, it is only the concrete action and suffering of this man, Jesus Christ, which will make it possible to understand what love is. The name of Jesus Christ, in which God reveals himself, gives the explanation of itself in the life and the words of Jesus Christ. For after all, the New Testament does not consist in an endless repetition of the name of Jesus Christ, but that which this name comprises is displayed in events, concepts, and principles which are intelligible to use. And so too, the choice of the concept of love, agape, it's not simply arbitrary. This concept requires an entirely new connotation of the New Testament message, yet it is not merely without con connexation with what we understand by love in our own language. Certainly, it is not true to say that the biblical concept of love is a particular form of which we are already in general understood by this word. Precisely the opposite turns out to be the case, namely that the biblical concept of love and it alone is a foundation, the truth, and the reality of love in the sense that any natural thought about love contains truth and reality only insofar as it participates in its origin, that is to say, in the love which God himself in Jesus Christ. We can now continue to follow the Bible in answering the question, what is love? Love is a reconciliation of man with God in Jesus Christ. The disunion of men with God and with other men and with the world and with themselves is at the end. Man's origin is given back to him. Love, therefore, is a name for which God does to man in overcoming the disunion in which man lives. This deed of God in Jesus Christ is reconciliation, and so love is something which happens to man, something passive, something over which he does not himself dispose, simply because it lies beyond his existence in disunion. Love means the undergoing of the transformation of one's entire existence by God. It means being drawn in into the world as it lives and must live before God and in God. Love, therefore, is not man's choice, but it is the election of man by God. So as I've just previously stated before I read all of this, again, God, he himself, is love. And through Christ's sanctification, through God's, through Christ, through God's Holy Spirit, which he gives us, once we become of Christ, can we be of love? Again, those who are not of love 
are not of God. But you as a Christian, you have to exemplify love daily. You have to be of love. You have to, again, exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit in your daily life to have the Holy Spirit reside in you. This I affirm in no uncertain terms, considering I do exorcism. <sighs> Which is fun at times, scary at times, <laughs> humbling at times. And again, as I previously stated, the exorcist has no power of their own on there. It's a total reliance on the Holy Spirit. It's a total reliance on God for protection, for empowerment. So when I go out and I do active field work in my community and elsewhere, cleansing an area and banishing the demonic, especially demonic activities like the suicide location in my town, for example, I am relying on God. But I can only go and do all this when God permits, of course. But that, again, is the point, because I have no power on my own. And I don't have to worry about the demons harming, it's just the people that are under vexation. So in my last sermon, I actually directly talked about the last time I did the field work in my town for, like, on my November 10th, so that week previous, which I had talked about in that past sermon, so. So that November 10th, which I will link that sermon to this sermon's video when I release this video on YouTube and Facebook later this evening. So, getting back to, the, to this. Love, therefore, is not man's choice, but is the election of man by God. In what sense, then, is it still possible to speak, as the New Testament does clearly enough, of love as an activity of men, of the love of man for God and for his neighbor? In view of the fact that God is love, what can now be meant by saying that man, too, can love and not to love? We love him because he first loved us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. This means that our love for God rests solely upon our being loved by God. In other words, that our love can be nothing other than the willing assumptions of the love of God in Jesus Christ. If any man loves God, the same is known of him. 1 Corinthians 8, 3. Known as a language of the Bible means elected and engendered. To love God means to accept willingly his election and his engendering in Christ. The relation between the divine love and human love is wrongly understood if we say that the divine love precedes the human love, but solely for the purpose of setting human love in motion as a love which, in relation to the divine, love is an independent free and autonomous activity in man. On the contrary, everything which is said of human love to you is governed by the principle that God is love. The love with which man loves God and his neighbor is the love of God and no other. Therefore is no other love. There is no love which is free or dependent from the love of God. As I previously stated, without God, without God in your life, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit residing in you, we, as humans, are quite incapable of this love. But because we were loved first by God, again, every single human, regardless, is a child of God, and God loves them very much. Because God loves them very much, God gives us this ability to love others, but of course we have to deal with our human nature and those who are unsaved, those who reject Christ, are unable to combat Lucifer's hold on them, the ruler of this world. And this is why, regardless, we as Christians have to love others. Love doesn't wrong to others. So treat everyone as you want to be treated, surely, and a thousand times more, which we'll be getting into later, but help those in need, treat every single human as your brother and sister, as your family, and give them this love that is unqualified, certainly, but above all, that love is unconditional. The love of one family member to another, this unconditional love that God gives each of us, we have to give to others, no matter, ma no matter what. And when people are harming others, of course, we have to correct them. 
And of course, this correction, so this accountability, this legal accountability to make sure that they get the help that they need, that they get the mental health help, the spiritual help, especially if they're being dominated by the spirit of hate, spirit of anger, make sure that they, again, get the help that they need, that they get depossessed, literally. This is why I definitely call it an exorcist for that, rebuke them, but make certain that they get the help that they need. Because in the exorcist training, from what we learn about people's personal demons, they are, in fact, demons. And they have to be treated, therefore, as. So the person who's struggling with their personal demons all their lives, these people you have to help, especially. So if they're overcome by anger, and of course, they're dealing with all these ailments that they're not getting mental health help from, you have to make sure that they get the mental health help from. So this is why they have alcoholics anonymous. This is why you have rehab shelters. This is why you help these people who are struggling with all these maladies, these afflictions, these tragedies, these traumas that they've been dealing with all their entire life. So when they're lashing out, harming others, again, this is why you have to love them especially, and you have to help them regardless if they want it or not, to make certain that they get the help that they desperately need. And I will be getting into why you have to love others, specific, and love everyone, especially those who harm others, and why you have to use that type of love to help save them, especially from themselves or what is specifically driving them, which I will be getting into shortly in concerning why we have to love our enemies. But continuing to Dietrich Bonhoeffer's point. So again, the love that which man loves God and his neighbor is the love of God and not of another. For therefore is no other love, there is no love which is free of independent of the love of God. In this then, the love of man remains purely passive. Loving God is simply the other aspect of being loved by God. Being loved by God implies loving God. The two do not stand separately side by side. In order to make this clearly intelligible, a further word of explanation necessary in regard to the use of the concept of passivity in the context. Here is always in theology when there is reference to the passivity of man. We do not concern the psychological concept of which one applies to the existence of man before God. That is to say, the theological concept. Passivity in respect to the love of God does not mean the exclusive exclusion of all thoughts, words, and deeds, which is possible when I seek repose in the love of God that can come to me only in a particular quiet hour. The love of God is only it's not the only haven or refuge in which I take shelter in distress. Being loved by God does not mean by any means to deprive a man of his mighty thoughts or his spirited deeds. It is a whole man, as men who think and who act, that we are loved by God and reconciled with God in Christ. And it is a whole man who thinks and who acts that we love God and our brothers. And of course, this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Ethics, which is composed of a lot of his notes and writings, which are hidden from the Gestapo. So now that we know what love is, now that's the question. So before I get a little bit further into this, let me go do a little more specific reading, especially concerning the Israel-Gaza conflict. And this is something that uh, Reverend Shea Claiborne said in the past number of days. Every decent human being should be able to say, bombing hospitals is wrong, bombing schools is wrong, bombing churches is wrong, bombing shelters is wrong, bombing refugee camps is wrong, killing children is wrong, killing journalists is wrong, killing doctors is wrong, shooting unarmed civilians is wrong, running over bodies and tanks is wrong, cutting off water is wrong, Cutting off electricity to premature babies on incubators is wrong. Burning down someone's home is wrong. Prohibiting medical supplies is wrong. Refusing humanitarian aid is wrong. Starving people to death is wrong. All of these things have been done by the state of Israel over the past month. And this is by Reverend Shea Claiborne. And this is something we've gotten to witness over this past month in this very, very bloody 
fratricidal genocidal conflict. And this is something that Reverend Shea Claiborne has also said in the past couple of days as well. The war in Gaza is like 9-11 in this way. Grief and trauma were exploited and used to justify atrocities that mirror the exact acts of terrorism that provoked it all. Defending ourselves was used to justify horrific violence on people who had nothing to do with committing the original act of violence. The terrorized can become the terrorizers. And battling the, the beast we can become the beast. Killing is a problem, not the solution. Two wrongs don't make a right. We will not build a peaceful world by killing each other's children. That's by Reverend Jake Claiborne. And, of course, this is something that I actually had posted, but I'm going to read it as well. It's amazing how clever the devil is. For those who want to dispute the numbers of children killed in Gaza, let me genuinely ask this. How many dead children do you think is enough to atone for the sins of Hamas? 1,400 people died on October 7th. Every one of them, a child of God, made in the image of God. Even those who adhere to a just war theory or knife for knife theology must be appalled by the massacre happening now in Gaza. There are over 9,000 people dead in Gaza, every one of them a child of God made in the image of God. Every life in Gaza is just as precious as every life in Israel. And every person killed in Gaza is just as offensive and evil as every person killed in Israel. That's by Reverend Shea Claiborne. The terrorists have now become the terrorizers. The cure is as bad as the disease. More violence does not heal the wounds of violence, it just creates new wounds. We cannot kill children to show that killing children is wrong. In battling the beast, we must not become the beast. Cease fire now, release the hostages now, stop the violence now. By Reverend Jake Claiborne, and again, with uh, ceasefire talks happening and a potential ceasefire happening shortly enough. But at the end of the day, it is not going to stop the bloodshed. Yeah, it's a temporary solution. So this is what uh, Friedrich Nietzsche had said. Whoever fights monsters should not see to it that in the process he does not become a monster. And if you gaze long enough in the abyss, the abyss will gaze back into you. Yeah, that's why Nietzsche. This is one of Nietzsche's most insightful aphorisms. And right now, it's terribly a props. Jesus says something similar. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light, but if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Matthew chapter 6, verses 23 through 23, and this is by Brian Zand, an Orthodox theologian. Both him and Reverend Shea Claiborne are both Orthodox, so this is why they mix perfectly well. So, and so again, okay, this is written by, by Pastor Jeff Hood. Before you write something as a scenario of this piece, it is wise to first and foremost dispel the myth that the modern nation of Israel and the Jewish people are the same thing. They are not. One is a political state pres presently determined to commit genocide in Gaza, Palestine. The other is a religion and ethnicity that is full of beautiful and kind people determined to make peace in the world, many of whom I call some of my dearest friends. Now that such a distinction has been established, it is important to move forward with the definition of Antichrist. Throughout the New Testament, whatever is contrary to the teaching of Jesus becomes embodied in that which is Antichrist. So, as I've previously stated, hatred and acts of hatred are open rebellion against God. They are Antichrist. So, a racist xenophobe isn't a Christian, and I fiercely affirm this as a legal or ordained reverend, because they do not have the light of the Lord in them. They do not have the Holy Spirit, because they are in rebellion. And they cannot serve God. Or at least they try to serve God, but half measures do not exist for the Christian.
So before I continue this, so half measures do not exist for the Christian. What are half measures, you might ask? Father Gabriel Amaroth in Nexus of Space and Demonic, the Antecedents Army of Fallen Angels, states thus God has given us everything. We must recognize only Him, adore only Him, and be guided by only Him, because inevitably, if we do not give to God, we necessarily give to idols. He who is not with me is against me, Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Half measures do not exist. Either we are of Christ or we are of Satan. At times, we'd like to go halfway, serving Christ partway. Well, that is not possible. The devious method that the devil used with Adam and Eve also works with us. It leads us to think that evil and sin do not exist, and that is sin, distancing ourselves from God, trying to each thing for the pleasure of having experiences again. So in the end, what evil is there? That's by Father Gabriel Amroth. Half measures do not exist for the Christian. You are either of God, love, peace, or you are of Satan, hatred, and everything else that is Antichrist. You cannot cherry pick what to follow, and you cannot serve God partially. You as a Christian can have devotion to anything other than God. God, he himself, is love. He is eternal, and his will is eternal. We therefore, as Christians, have to be of love without exception and love others with unconditional love, we as Christians, our entire existence is predicated on love. A racist, a xenophobe, someone who fails majesty in God's image, isn't a Christian, officially or otherwise, and I have to affirm this as a legal ordained reverend. As we know, there is a demonic spirit known as hate, hatred, which gives temptation, demonic suggestion to those who are susceptible to harm and kill others. What you do to others matters. What you say to others matters. What you do to others really does matter, and I'll get to the point after I finish that. So let's return to that. So again, throughout the New Testament, whatever is contrary to the teaching of Jesus becomes a body of that which is Antichrist. I cannot imagine an action more opposed to the teaching of Jesus than genocide. Let there be no doubt when Jesus wept as helpless young people were slaughtered, old people were executed, and babies were stuffed out, along the Israel borders with Gaza by the terrorist group Hamas. Again, Hamas is evil, but however, so is who are they are opposed, at least the state-wise. Such actions are obviously anti-Christ. They do not reflect the teachings of Jesus. Again, they do not Reflect the cheeks of Jesus. Where was Jesus in such a moment? Jesus was there, is there, and will forever be there with the hurting. But there, but such an attack, no matter how awful, does not give Israel permission to commit genocide. To say I've been troubled by the relentless bombing in Gaza by the Israeli government would be an understatement. How could you not be? Countless people are being blown to bits. So much so that blood and guts are spirit on every street. Instead of exercising restraint, Israel is bombing so much infrastructure in these communities as they possibly can, leaving no water, no food, no medical care, no help. The intentional destruction of a particular ethnic group of people is genocide. And I've talked about this before in my past two sermons, actually. What the definition of genocide is. As a human right, certified human rights consultant. So, the nation of Israel is rarely bombing military targets. They are mostly bombing hospitals, schools, and homes. The least of these, those whom Christ said he favors the most, are getting slaughtered day in and day out. What could be more anti-Christ? It is evil. It comes from the devil, just as colonialism comes from the devil, like racism comes from the devil. When you take people's land, when you commit genocide, that is evil. It doesn't take a Christian to tell you that. It doesn't take a Jew to tell you that. It doesn't take a Muslim to tell you that. All you have to do is be human to know that murderous oppression and destruction is always evil. And that's by Pastor Jeff Hood. So his reasoning is the modern state of Israel is evil. But of course, in his belief right there, He is judging Israel. Sorry, I'm reading for a book. And because of that judgment right there, he's judging the whole state instead of the individual 
people that make up the state. So it's collective punishment is what he's doing. And because of that, as still isn't, isn't of Christ. And this is the difference I'm trying to point out. Is the Hamas organization and their genocidal designs for Israel Antichrist. The desire for destruction of human life is Antichrist. The purposeful aim of destruction and annihilation of humans. No matter what ethnicity or religion is Antichrist. And so what Israel has been doing to the Palestinians for 50 odd years or so is that Antichrist. Absolutely. For ethnic cleansing and genocide, the desire to take land, move people by force, kill them as necessary, and destroy entire lives. That is Antichrist. Again, Lucifer will now win a conventional war against God, so he'll use those who are susceptible to as well, those dominated by hatred and anger. Those consumed, dominated with those types of demonic spirits, he will use those susceptible to harm and kill others. This is irrevocably proven. This is shown every single time in every single action as it happens. And now that I've gotten all of that out of the way, so I'm going to be reading two short chapters here. Keyword. I know, I tried to get this sermon to less than an hour, but it kind of blew up a little bit, but that's okay. With everything that's happening right now, I have a lot I have to speak. I haven't done a sermon in a couple of weeks, so I do apologize for that, but I've been very, very busy preparing for the holiday season because my family is deciding to do Christmas at Thanksgiving, so, <laughs> yeah. So a lot of plans, stuff upended, and yeah, I had a lot of stuff to prepare in very short order. But even during those weeks that I've been very, very busy, it doesn't mean that I have not been keeping up to date with everything that's happening, that I've been praying, and of course I actually had, did like another consecration after my one on November 10th, so, so three consecrations this month. So, I'm going to be reading The Disciple and Unbelievers, and I'm going to be reading the chapter so, of the enemy. So, this is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. So, chapter 18, The Disciple and the Unbelievers. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. For whatever the judge meant, ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with whatever measure meant, it shall be measured unto you. And why beholdest thou the mode in thy brother's eye, but thou considerest not the beam in thy own eye, or thou wilt say to thy brother, Let me cast out the moon on thine eye, when though the beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out the first beam in thine own eye. Then shall ye be able to see cl clearly to cast out the moon in thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither shall your pearls cast before swine, lest they happily they trample on their own feet and turn and rend you. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, that he thinketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there for you, for whom, if your son shall ask him a love, shall give him a stone? If he ask for a fish, and you give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, how, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them that ask him. All things therefore ye, so everyone that ye wish to do, to men should do unto you, even so do ye also unto them, for that is the law and the prophets. So as I said before, treat others as you wish to be treated. So Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 12. But this raises the question of the relationship between the Christians and their non-Christian neighbors. 
Does their separation from the rest of society confer on them the special rights and privileges? Do Christians enjoy power, gifts, and standards of judgment by which to qualify them to exert a particular authority over others? How easy it would have been for the disciples to adopt a superior attitude to pass unqualified condemnation on the rest of the world and to persuade themselves that this was the will of God. That is why Jesus had to make it clear beyond all doubt that such misunderstandings would seriously impair their discipleship. The disciples are not to judge. If they do so, they will themselves be judged by God. And the sword worth they judge their brother and will fall upon their own heads. Instead of cutting themselves off from their brother as a just from the unjust, they find themselves cut off from Jesus. Why should this be so? The source of the disciples' life lies exclusively in the fellowship with Jesus Christ. He possesses his righteousness only within association, never outside of it. This is why his righteousness can never become an object criterion to be applied to will. He is a disciple not because he possesses such a new standard, but only because Jesus Christ, the mediator and the very Son of God, this is to say his righteousness is hidden from himself in fellowship with Jesus. He cannot, as he could once, be detached observer of himself and judge himself, for he can only see Jesus and be seen by him, judged by him, and reprieved by him. It is not an approved standard of righteous living that separates a follower of Christ from the unbeliever, but it is a Christ who stands between them. Christ always sees other men as a brother to whom Christ comes. They meet them only by going to them with Jesus. Disciple and non-disciple can never encounter each other as free men, directly exchanging their views and judging one another by objective criteria. No, the disciple can meet the, the non-disciple only as a man to whom Jesus comes. Here alone, not disciple. Here alone, Christ fight for the soul of the unbeliever. His call, his love, his grace, and his judgment comes into its own. Discipleship does not afford us a point of vantage from which to attack others. We come to them with unconditional offer of fellowship, with single-mindedness of the love of Jesus. Again, this is very important, and this is something that all these fallen Christians do not adhere to the love of Jesus because they believe quite falsely that they can target those that they despise and still believe they can be of Christ but of course half measures do not exist because of because of their actions of not choosing love or peace they their actions are Satan automatically and this is the reality of it all. Again, what you do to others, you do so unto God. And this is the double meaning of imagine the same in God's image. Every single person is created in God's image, but God is in each human that you meet. So God is going to make demands of you, calls you, speaks to you. What you do to others, you do so unto God. And in the final judgment, you are going to be judged by what you do to others every single act so the so what is going to judge you in that final judgment is going to be the love that you have shown others because what you've done to others again you have done to god and again this is why your entire existence as a christian is predicated on love all of your actions towards others has to be from love it cannot be from anything that is antichrist hatred anger anything. This is why you have to fight your human nature daily and you have to overcome it, but only you can only come it through the Holy Spirit. And this is the reality. When you meet others, when you commune with others, when you talk to others, when you are with others, again, Christ took the form of that person. Besides you, Christ is in that person. What you do to others, you do so unto God. This is the reality. So, again, now we come to them with an unconditional offer of fellowship and with a single mindedness of the love of Jesus. When we judge other people, we confront them in the spirit of detachment, observing and reflecting as if we were the outside. But love has neither time nor opportunity for this. If we love, we can never observe the other person with detachment, for he is always and at every moment a living claim to our love and service. This is very important right here. Again, that other person... For he is always, at every moment, a living claim of our love and our service. So that, every single person. The other person is 
again, that other human, again, they, because God is in them. So what you do to others, you do so unto God. And this is why the other person is the limit that God has placed upon you. If you ever surpass that limit and you harm others, what you do to others, again, you do so unto God. And you've placed yourself in spiritual peril, to say the very least. And that's excluding, again, of course, God can and will enact the law of consequences. So what you do to others, again, that sword that you use on others will return to your own head very quickly. So, continuing that point. Again, love has neither the time nor opportunity to this. If we love, we can never observe the other person in the detachment, for he is always at the very moment a living claim on our love and service. But does not the evil in the other person make me condemn him just as for his own good and for the sake of love? Here we see the depths of the divine line. Any misguided love for the sinner is ominously close to the love of sin, but the love of Christ for the sinner in itself is a condemnation of sin and is expressed in extreme hatred of sin. The disciple of Christ are to love unconditionally. Again, we have to love others unconditionally, especially if they are harming others around us, and we have to confront them with this love which I'll be getting to shortly enough after I finish this chapter. But, again, thus, they may affect that their undivided and judicially and conditionally offered love neither could achieve, namely the radical combination of sin. If the disciples make judgments of their own, they set the standards of good and evil, but Christ is not a standard which I apply to others. He is a judge of myself, revealing my own virtues to me as something altogether evil. Thus, I am not permitted to apply to the other person what does not apply to me. For with my judgment according to good and evil, I only affirm the other person's evil. For he does exactly the same thing. But if he does not know the hidden equity of the good, but seeks his justification, and if I condemn his evil actions, I thereby confirm him. It is apparently good actions which are yet not never the good commended by Christ. Thus we remove him from the judgment of Christ and subject to human judgment, but I bring God's judgment upon my own head. For I then do not live any more on and out of the grace of Jesus Christ, but out of my own knowledge of good and evil, which I hold on to. To everyone, God is the kind of God he believes in. Judgment is a forbidden observation of the other person, which destroys a single mind love. I am not forbidden to have my own thoughts about the other person who realizes his shortcomings, but only to the extent that it offers me an occasion of forgiveness and unconditional love. As Jesus proves to me, if I withhold my judgment, I am not indulging in two de compartir de partner, but confirm the other person in his bad ways. Neither am I on the other person, but God is always right and shall proclaim both his grace and his judgment. Judging others make us blind, whereas love is limiting. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil, to the grace which others are just or entitled to, as we are. But in the love of Christ, we now know all about every conceivable sin and guilt. We know how Jesus suffered and how all men have been forgiven at the foot of the cross. Christian love sees the fellow men under the cross and thereby sees with clarity. If then we judge others, our real motive was to destroy evil. We should look for evil where it is certainly found, that is with our own hearts. Again, our human nature is intrinsically evil, so evil is always going to be our selves. And this is the reality of it, too. That, of course, Jesus Christ... We are given the Holy Spirit, and God gives us through Jesus Christ our Lord. And sorry, I actually didn't notice that until now. But so again, through the Holy Spirit that God gives us, through that Holy Spirit, can we overcome the evil that is our human nature? And we have to do this daily through prayer through following Jesus' tenets and testaments, with no exception, especially loving others. And of course, the sin is defined as harming others, as I just previously stated. So therefore, outside of the sin of lust, so it's very simple. If you want to live the way of Christ, don't harm others, period. Verbally or otherwise. And this is the difference between those who have the Holy Spirit and those who don't. Again, you have to exemplify the fruits of the Spirit in your daily life to have the Holy Spirit reside in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So, but if we are to look out for evil 
You know, if a real motive is obviously just to fire ourselves, we are seeking to escape punishment for our own sins by passing judgment on others, assuming by implication that the word of God applies to ourselves in one way and to others in another. All this is highly dangerous and misleading. We are trying to claim for ourselves a special privilege which we deny to others, but Christ's disciples have no rights of their own or stands of right and wrong which they can enforce on other people that they have received nothing but Christ's fellowship. Again, we as Christians... Have no right to control, to abuse, to dehumanize, to try to control and dominate others. This is not of Christ. The other human is the limitation Jesus has placed on us. So if we try to surpass that limitation by dominating others, like fallen Christians, these Christian nationalists, etc., Trump supporters, same difference, really. Those who are consumed, dominated by hatred, those who sold their souls to Lucifer, to do such things, to try to proclaimed to be of Christ, but they have not the Holy Spirit in them, because the light of the Lord is no longer in them. As previously stated, because for the Christian, there can be... you cannot serve Christ by half measure. But the Christian is not only forbidden to judge other men, even the word salvation has its limits. He has neither power nor right to force on other men in season out of season. Every attempt to impose the gospel by force, to run after people, to proselyze them, to use our own resources, to arrange the salvation of other people, is both futile and dangerous. It's futile because the swine do not recognize the pearls that cast before him dangerous because it profanes the word of forgiveness. By causing those we fain would serve to sin against that which is holy, worse still, we should only meet with a blind rage of hatred, dark at hearts, and that will be useless and harmful. Our easy trafficking with the word of cheap grace simply bores the world to disgust, so that in the end it turns to those who try to force on it which it does not want. And of course, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. And of course, I'm paraphrasing Dietrich Bonhoeffer right there as well, but as a statement, so... You cannot have forgiveness without requiring repentance. Repentance is change the changing of ways. This is why I do not do blind dispensations. I will tell people if they want forgiveness, they have to repent, they have to change. Only by changing and atoning for what they've done, God is going to forgive them. I will not I will not absolve them of their sins because that is not my purpose. Since I am given church discipline path, I am to deal directly with the demonic. Which is, of course, correcting when Christians are fallen, especially. So I'm not the priest you would go to confession because I'm the one who deals directly with those who have spiritual evils. Or those who have fallen, lost, cast away, those who sold their soul to Lucifer to continue to try to profess to be of Christ, but they do not have the Holy Spirit in them. But the thing, but when the Holy Spirit is imbued in them, something else is there and take up shop, taking a residence, taking claim. And so when they're harming others, I myself have to act. This is why, yes, I do sacraments happily. And yes, a consecration, banishment. And there's been instances where I've had to do major exorcism on people under vexation. And again, I have no control whatsoever, so it's a fun experience in that aspect because getting to watch as God's presence enters the area and the person who's under possession has an aversion to that holy energy. and getting significantly very, very weak as a subsequent result. Yeah, as I said. It's illuminating, it's fun and interesting certainly, and very scary too. But then again, this is why I myself have to, I myself am a love and have to be always. Because if I want to hold the Holy Spirit, God's presence, God's ability that I've been given, God's gift I've been given, I have to have the Holy Spirit reside in me. And the only way for me to personally do this, again, not just read the Bible, not just pray continuously, but to actually live this life of Christ, to love others, to help others, to know in no uncertain terms that the other person before me 
is the limitation Jesus has placed on me and the person that I am designated to help, that they are my brother and my sister. So I have to love that person with unconditional love, and I have to do my best to help, safeguard, protect, and do all the best that I can do, because in service to that person, you are doing so unto God, which I'll be getting to very shortly. So, but continuing on this point. So thus the strict limit is placed upon the activity of the disciples, just in Matthew chapter 10, they are told to shake the dust off of their feet where the word of peace is refused to healing. Their restless energy which refuses to recognize any limit to their activity, the zeal which refuses to take no resistance, springs from a confusion of the gospel of the victorious ideology. An ideology requires fanatics, whom neither knows nor knows his opposition is certainly put in force, but the word of God in its weakness takes the risk of meeting the scorn of men and being rejected. There are hearts which are hardened and doors which are close to the word. The word recognizes opposition when Jesus is prepared to suffer for it. And this is the point. You as a Christian, you have to be prepared to suffer. When you face someone who is under the direct rule of the ruler of this world, so someone who is not saved. And this is a reality. This is the same, same line when I have to go do field work and I come upon a person who's under vexation, like I talked about in my last sermon about what happened. And this is, this, this is a reality that I myself have to face as legal or damn reverend, this young priest who goes out and does exorcism for his community. Because all my ability comes from God alone. All power, anything, everything. I have no power on my own. No power whatsoever. It is all God. For me. God using me. And so this is the point which Dietrich Bonhoeffer was trying to make. The disciples not to yield the ground and run away, provided they do so with the word, providing their weakness is the weakness of the word, provided they do not leave the word and search in their flight. They are simply the servants and instruments of the word. They have no wish to be strong where the word chooses to be weak. To try and force the word on the world by hook or by crook is to make the living word of God to a mere idea, and the world would be perfectly justified to refuse to listen to an idea with which it has no use. At other times, the disciples must stick their guns, refuse to run away, though of course only when the word so wills. If they do not realize this weakness of the word, they have failed to perceive the mystery of the divine humility. The same weakness, same weak word which is content to endure the gainsaying of the sinners is also the mighty word of the mercy which can convert the hearts of sinners. If strength is veiled in weakness, if it can, came in power, that would mean that the day of judgment had arrived. The great task of the disciples is to recognize the limits of their commission. But if they refuse the word of the word amiss, it will certainly turn against them. What are the disciples to do when they encounter opposition and cannot penetrate the hearts of men? They must admit that in no circumstances do they possess any rights or powers over others, and that they have no direct access to them. And this is the point. We cannot run after people and proselyze them after them, especially when we ourselves do not live the word of God. And again, the, again, the word of again, God is not going to be with those who do such things as I previously say these fallen Christians that do. God is not with them, and is never going to be, because they are zealots and they do not recognize the fact that God is not with them. And so we, as Christians ourselves, we have to recognize what the limitations are, and the limitation is the other person. And we cannot prophesize others if we do not live by the word of God. And again, we can only prophesize others only so by actually living, by being of love, being of peace, by doing so. By doing so, can we reach the heart of others? By God using us to do so. Again, this is why you have to have the Holy Spirit reside in you. You have to exemplify the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your daily life. Again, what you do to others says a lot about you. You a fruit a tree is defined a tree is known by its fruits, after all. So you are defined by your actions and your words. What you say to others matters, what you do to others matters. 
So again, what are the disciples to do when they encounter opposition and cannot penetrate the hearts of men? The only way to reach others is through him in whose hands they themselves are like other men. We feel more or less we see the disciples are taught to pray, and so they learn that the only way to reach others is by praying to God. So again, what are disciples to do when they encounter opposition and cannot penetrate the hearts of men? They are to pray. He closes and he opens. Judgment and forgiveness are always in the hands of God. But the disciples must ask, they must seek and knock, and then God will hear them. They have to learn that their anxiety and concern for others must drive them to intercession. The promise that Christ gives to their prayer is the Taoist weapon in their armory. And that's, again, the most powerful weapon in your armory is prayer. Of course, your anxiety for others, your worry for others, that the fact that, A, because they are not saved, they are not going to reach heaven because they do not have the Holy Spirit in them, they are not going to reach heaven. This is why you have to pray for others. And you have to pray for others whose hearts are hardened and stifled by hatred because they are, are as Dietrich Bonhoeffer finds, are our enemies. Which I was actually going to actually read that chapter, but I've read that chapter about a thousand times at this point. So, and I know in my last sermon, I actually did talk about it and I read about it. So I'm going to reference right here to take a look at the November 10th sermon concerning our enemies. So when confronting everything in this world, the evils of this world and other human beings, Instead of going about it the way the world goes about it, we are to pray first and foremost. God will answer according to what is in our hearts. So, and I'm going to close that chapter with that. So, again, so when you reach encounter opposition, to Christ, when you encounter anything in general, when confronting the evils of this world, you pray. God will answer according to what is in your heart, especially if it's good, of love. This is why you have to begin with love and peace. So, of course, confront the evils of this world with prayer, more than intercession. Pray for those whose hearts are stifled with hatred because they are enemies. Pray for those who are in dire distress, no matter what, and pray for others in general. With all, and pray for others, all kinds of prayers and requests, and pray to God, and God is going to answer. You know, this is how you confront the evils of this world, through prayer. And when I go out and I do exorcism, my main weapon is prayer. Fair and simple. Because I am reliant on the Holy Spirit. I have no power on my own. No ability on my own. Everything comes from the Holy Spirit. So, again, to sum up, it is clear for the foregoing that the disciple has no special privilege or power of his own on all his intercourse with others. The main spring of his life and work is the strength which comes from the fellowship of Jesus Christ. Jesus offers the disciples a simple rule of thumb which enables even the least sophisticated of them to tell whether his intercourse with others is on the right lines or not. All I need to say is I, instead of thou, and put himself in the other man's place. All things, whatever ye would do, that men should do unto you, even so ye do so unto them, so that is the law and the prophets. The moment he does that, the disciple forfeits all advantage over other men and can no longer excuse himself what he condemns in others. He is strictly condemned the evil himself as he was before with others and is lenient with the evil as others as he was before himself. The evil and the other person exact the same evil as yourselves. There is only one judgment, one law, and one grace. Henceforth, the disciple will look upon other men as forgiven sinners with whom who owe their lives to the love of God. This is the law of the prophets. For this is none other than the supreme commandment to love God above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. And again, our enemies are those who wish to do us harm, not those whom we cherish to do hostility, because Jesus refused to reckon with such ability. Such a possibility. So I'm actually going to read a couple of inserts uh, from chapter 13, The Enemy. 
By our enemies, Jesus means those who required and traceable and utterly responsible to be loved, who forgive us death and we forgive them, who required our love with hatred and our service with derision. For the love I say unto thee, lo, now they take my contrary part, but I give myself into prayer. Psalm 109, 4. Love asks nothing in return, but seeks those who need it, and who needs our love more than those who are consumed with hatred and utterly devoid of love. And right here in that passage, Jesus Bonhoeffer states, you are, hatred, you are enemies of those whose hearts are consumed and dominated by hatred. Those whose hearts are consumed with hatred and utterly devoid of love. This is the enemy of the Christian. People who are not of love. People whose hearts are stifled with hatred. So an un... So, in those specific terms. Again, God is love. And we have to be a love to be of God. Our entire existence is predicated on love. And our enemies are those whose hearts are stifled or consumed with hatred. So again, who, in other words, deserves our love more than our enemy? Where is love more glorified than where she dwells in the midst of her enemies? Christian love draws no distinction between one enemy and another except the more bitter our enemy's hatred, the greater his need of love. Be his enemy, political or religious, he has nothing to expect from the follower of Jesus but unqualified love. In such love, there is no inner discord between private person and official capacity. Both we are disciples who are of Christ who are not Christian at all. Am I to ask how this love behaves? Jesus gives the answer, Bless, do good, and pray for your enemies without reserve and without respect to persons. Love your enemies. The preceding commandment has spoken only a passive endurance evil, but here Jesus goes further. The business not only to bear with the evil and the evil person patiently, not only refrain from treating him as he treats us, but to actively engage in heartfelt love towards him. We are to serve our enemy in all things without hypocrisy and utter sincerity. No sacrifice which is love to make for his beloved is too great for us to make for our enemy. If out of love for our brother, we will only sacrifice goods, honor, and life. We must prepare to do so for the same for our enemy. We are not imagined that this is to get known as evil. Such love proceeds from strength rather than from weakness from truth rather than fear, and from therefore cannot be guilty of hatred of another. And again, this is the point about loving others and confronting them, the evils of this world, with love, because it cannot be guilty of the hate of another. And who is to be the object of such love, if not those whose hearts are stifled with hatred? And again, Dietrich Bonhoeffer states in no uncertain terms, our enemies as Christians are defined as those whose hearts are stifled with hatred. Pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. This is a supreme demand. Through the medium prayer, we go to our enemies, stand by his side, and plead to him to God. Jesus does not promise that when we bless our enemies to do good for them, they will not despitefully use or persecute us. They certainly will. But that is not even can hurt or overcome us so long as we pray for them. For if we pray for them, we are taking their distress, their poverty, their guilt, and perdition upon ourselves, and pleading to God for them. We are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. Every insult the outer only brings us, only serves to bind us more closely to God and them. Their persecution of us only serves to bring us, bring them near to reconciliation to God and the further triumphs of love. And again, pray for those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. In prayer, you bring, you plead to God on the person's behalf. You bring their perdition upon yourselves. You bring their case to God. You do vicariously for them what they cannot do for others. This is why prayer is love. And this sermon is definitely going to be closer to two hours, so I'm going to finish up pretty soon. So I'm going to be reading two passages and I'm going to be calling it relatively quits. So... So Matthew chapter 25, here we are. Chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And all the nations shall be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right, and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you 
blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, or give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger, and take you in, or naked, and clothe you? Or when do we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, it is much as you did it to one of the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And you also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not come visit me. Then they also answer, saying, Lord, when we did see you hungry and thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick in prison, and did not minister to you. And they will answer them, saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it, at least of these, you did not do it unto me. And they will go away in everlasting punishment by the righteous into eternal life. So again, Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. This is Jesus' warning to his disciples and to us. What you do to others, you do so unto him. So this is why you have to help the infirm, the poor, the weak, the destitute, those suffering. Because ministering to others, you do so unto God. So what you do not do to others, so, if you do not do these things to others, you do not do this to God, and this is why you, yourself, will inherit that which those of rebellion will inherit at everlasting fire. Because again, what you do to others matters, and this is why if you do not help those who are suffering, this is why the apathy to evil comes into play. Silence in the face of evil is self-evil. God will not hold guiltless, to not speak as to speak, to not act as to act. So this is the when for the Luke chapter ten concerning the Good Samaritan parable, this is why you have to help others, because doing so you do so unto God. Because God took our form. This is the thing that matches day. God took our form. God is in every single person around you. And this is the reality of it. And so I'm going to be taking your reading for Dietrich Harnifer's Guys and the Major Effects of Advent and Christmas Advent Season. So, hello. Jesus stands at the door knocking, Revelation 3.20, and told a reality he comes in the form of the beggar and the desolate human child in rag clothes, asking for help. He confronts you and every person that you meet. As long as there are people, Christ will walk the earth as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls you, speaks to you, and makes demands of you. This is a great series, a great blessed Advent message. Christ is standing at the door. He lives in the form of the human being among us. And this is a reality. God is in every single person that you meet. As long as there are people on this earth, Christ will walk with us as your neighbor, as the one through whom God calls you, speaks to you, makes demands of you. What you do so unto others, you do so unto God. But not only that, I do have this other warning. So sacrifice is pleasing unto God. So Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you are also in the body. Again, every single human is your brother and sister. So watching this, these conflicts that are happening with Ukraine, of course, but especially the very bloody and genocidal Israel-Gaza conflict. Seeing all the death, all the destruction, all the carnage, all the genocide, all the ruthless annihilation of civilians. And their desire to be that beast, that Israel, as of course Hamas, both sides have to be opposed. Both Hamas and Israel should be, and need to be. And I'm going to be rereading a couple things from Shea Claiborne on that. So an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for life. Revenge makes the world a sick place. I'll never understand these politicians who are so upset about the killing of children that they are ready to kill more children. The way of Jesus is love, not revenge. That's by Reverend Shea Claiborne. You've also heard that it was an eye for, uh, an eye, for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. 
And you have heard that I have said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. Matthew chapter 5, which I just went over with uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer as the enemy. So collective punishment is evil. The people of Israel should not be punished for the sins of their government. Neither should the people of Gaza be punished for the sins of Hamas terrorists. Killing children is wrong, evil, demonic, whether it is done by the terrorists or by a nation state, by Reverend Shea Claiborne. For hundreds of years, Jewish people have been the victims of horrific violence. This historic backdrop of pain and trauma does not justify the crushing apathy policies they impose on Gaza and the West Bank for over 50 years. So the, especially the ethnic cleansings. But it does help explain it. For decades, the Palestinians have endured daily doses of terror, discrimination, and abuse from the state of Israel. That does not by any means justify the violence of Hamas, but it does explain it. The current violence for both Hamas and the state of Israel create the condition for more violence, adding more fuel to our combustible fire. For many people, the evil we are seeing today about the state of Israel and Hamas make more killing justifiable, but violence only leads to more violence. Hatred begets more hatred. We cannot build a better future by killing each other's children. Jesus was right. If we live by the sword, we die by the sword. Violence is a dead end. Love is the only way forward, even the audacious love of our enemies. And this is why I closed with that. Love your enemies. Do good for those who persecute you. Pray for them. Heal their hearts. But above all, if they do not have the Holy Spirit in them, or if it's muted, unmute it. Pray for them. Hold to legal accountability but make certain that they get the help that they need. This is part of your mission as a Christian, is to save others, especially from what's inside of them. But this is why you do so. Only with prayer and love, only through peace and love can you achieve this. So before I finish this, I'm going to be taking a reading from, and that's just Spain the Bonnet and Satan's Army of Fallen Angels. So the last judgment will be the love that will judge us. The last judgment, when Christ returns to his glory, only the Father knows the day and the hour, only he determines the moment that's coming. Then through his Son, Jesus Christ, will he pronounce the final word in all history. We shall know the awesome meaning of the whole work of creation of the entire economy of salvation and understand the marvelous ways with which his providence led everything towards his final end. This is one of the most difficult realities to understand. The last judgment coincides with the return of Christ. However, we do not know the precise time it will occur. We know that it will be preceded immediately by the resurrection of the dead. In that precise moment, the history of the world will definitively and globally end. The cashism again specifies in the presence of Christ, who is truth itself. The truth of each man's relationship with God will be laid bare. John chapter 12, verse 49. The essential question is, what concrete rapport that man, each man has with God? As I have mentioned, the solemn response is found in the Gospel of Matthew. The saved and the damned will be chosen on the basis of their recognition or rejection of Christ and the infirm, and the hungry and the poor and the weak. Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46, which I just went over. Two essential elements emerge from this. The first is a division of schism between those going to paradise and those going to hell, between the saved and the condemned. The second in regards to the manner in which the judgment will be accomplished with love. God's commandments and every other precept are summarized solely in one commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. John chapter 15 verse 12. We can easily understand that this command is addressed to each human conscience in every age, including those who lived before Christ, those who today, as centuries past, never heard anyone speak of the Son of Man. Therefore, the finale of Sependus passes a beautiful passage from Matthew. Truly I say to you, as you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did to me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. If each man, apart from his religion, his culture, his epoch, and any other circumstance, has loved his neighbor, he has also loved the Lord Jesus in person. Any rapport with our brothers and sisters, any locality, any age, or any situation is all in all a rapport with Jesus Christ in person. Each human creature who achieves fulfillment in his love relationships is at the same time related to God. For this reason, love of the neighbor is the fundamental precept of life. John the Evangelist helps us to understand that we cannot say that we love God, whom we cannot say if we do love our brother whom we can see. First John chapter 4, verse 20. The love that will judge will be the same love that we have or have not practiced towards others. The same love that Jesus lived in his earthly experience to toss in the gospel. The same love with which we are entitled through the sacraments, through prayer, and through a life of faith. The ability to love comes from grace. It is much reduced in those who do not know Christ, and even more so in those who do know him but choose not to follow him, a choice that seems a serious sin. And again, this is Gabriel Amroth's ruling on this. Again, love comes from grace. It is much reduced in those who do not know Christ, even more so in those who do know him but choose not to follow him, a.k.a. so anyone 
who professes to be of a Christian but does not love others. But anyone who professes to be a Christian but has hatred towards others, they do not have the holy light of the Lord inside of them. They can lie to humans, but they cannot lie to God. Again, love comes from grace. Love comes from God. It is much reduced in those who do not know Christ, even more so those who do know him, but choose not to follow him. So if someone professes to be of Christ, but is hateful towards others, they are not of Christ. They are not of love. They are not of God. They do not have the Holy Spirit. I affirm this as a legally ordained reverend. Indeed, Jesus says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. On the other hand, in announcing extraordinary duty of mercy, Pope Francis reminds that the other fundamental aspect of the question is that the love with which we shall be judged will be the love of mercy. Mercy is the ultimate and supreme act by which God comes to meet us. This mercy, he says, is the bridge that connects God and man and opens our hearts to the hope of being loved forever despite our sinfulness. God's compassionate glance and his desire to live in total communion with us opens our hearts to the hope that each sin and each fail inflicted on man by his great enemy, Satan, will be looked upon in the eyes of a loving, accepting Father. Therefore, let us live full of hope because we know that even in the difficulty of life's journey, God will wipe away all the tears from our eyes. On that day, death shall be no more. Neither shall be no mourning, nor crying, nor pain, nor any more. For former things have passed away. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And I will close with that. Because in the final judgment, you will be judged by the love you give others in this life. Because again, what you do to others, you do so unto God. So as we start this holiday season with Thanksgiving and the weeks leading up and through Christmas, so the reminder is love others, not just in your life, but everyone around you. Do good to others. Make your world a better place by being of love. Help those who are suffering. Help those who are in need. Do not turn a blind eye to human suffering. And as with this ongoing Israel-Gaza conflict, get involved with humanitarian organizations. Get involved in the war to make certain that it ends. Not just the ceasefire, because the ceasefire is only a temporary measure. It's not going to solve what's happening, nor is it going to solve the continuous amounts of casualties of not combatants of the innocent, because in wars and conflicts, as I previously stated, God is in the rebel. And as previously stated in my October 10th sermon, was it? Concerning uh, Again, concerning the demonic and wars and conflicts. Again, you as a Christian are always going to be defined by your actions and your words and by what you do to others because, again, as previously stated, there is no half measure. Half measures do not exist for a Christian. You either are, are of love and peace or your Satan, hatred, and everything else that is antichrist. You have to be of love to be of Christ. You have to be of peace to be of Christ. And what does the Bible say about peacemakers? So, I'm actually going to be looking at the beauty cubes. So, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The followers of Christ have been called to peace, but when he called them, they found their peace, and for that, for he is their peace. But now they are told they are not only to have peace, but to make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult. In the cause of Christ, nothing is gained by such methods. His kingdom is one of peace, and a mutual greeting of his flock is a greeting of peace. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves rather than inflict it on others. And as stated in the sermon a bit earlier, the other human is a limitation Jesus has placed upon you. What you do to others, you do so unto God. What you do to them, you do so unto God. And again, you're going to have to answer that in the final judgment. So half measures do not exist. And again, Romans chapter 13. 
Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong with the neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so, again, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. This is the definition of sin. Sin is harming others in any conceivable way, verbal abuse or otherwise. So as we are celebrating the holidays, Thanksgiving and through Christmas, this is the reminder what sin is. So when you have a family member who's being racist or xenophobic to concerning others, you have a choice. You can either be complacent to evil, apathetic to evil, so silence the face of evil is itself evil. God would not hold guiltless, did not speak as a speak, to not act as to act, aka the person who is apathetic to what is happening, they are going to be counted as equally as guilty as a perpetrator by God. So again, if you encounter someone of your family during this holiday season, correct them. Correct them for their own betterment. Especially for their, because again, they are spiritually imperiled, they continue to harm others. And that, of course, is excluding the fact that they're giving into demonic suggestion to harm and kill others. So either the spirit of hatred or the spirit of anger, which are both subservient to the spirit of murder, which I've talked about previously concerning demonization. So again, you're tempted every single day, but God gives you the power, the ability to overcome that temptation, to choose not to give in to that temptation. So the choice, again, is always yours. So again, half measures do not exist. You're either of God, love, peace, or Satan, hatred, and everything else. So you have to confront the evils of this world. So even in the family setting, you still have to confront the evils of this world. So yes, if a family member is saying something racist, xenophobic, rebuke them. Hold them to accountability set them straight. And this is the purpose, A, to save them from themselves, save them in general, and help protect and safeguard others. So again, because you as a Christian are called to be a peacemaker in order to be a child of God. So again, you as a Christian will have to endure suffering, then inflict it on others. And so, returning to that point. His disciples keep the peace by choosing to suffering themselves rather than inflict on others. They maintain fellowship where others would break it off. They renounce all self-assertion and quietly suffer in the face of hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of a world of war and hate. But nowhere will the peace be more manifest than where they are to meet the wicked in peace and are ready to suffer at their hands. The peacemakers will carry the cross of their Lord, for it was on the cross that peace was made. Now they are our partners in Christ's work of reconciliation. They are called the sons of God as he is the son of God. So we as Christians have to renounce all violence or tumult, and the cause of Christ is not going to be served by such methods of violence, tumult, and everything that these fallen Christians do to proselytize and try to control and dominate others because again the other person is a limitation that jesus has placed on us so if you want to overstep that limitation given that tip demonic suggestion to go for it but understand damnation and again that is why there's a limitations you are either of christ love peace or you're satan hatred and everything else that is antichrist and open rebellion against God. You are given this choice every single day in your actions, in your words, and what you do to others. Especially when you're confronted with events where people are being harmed around you, you have to intervene. Verbally, physically, spiritually. You have to safeguard and protect and help because again, every single person as your brother and sister, according to God's promise to Abraham, which was filled in the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. And 
And so I'm actually going to close with that. So this holiday season, again, that time that you are with your family, spend it, be happy, love, of course. But again, remember with everything that's happening in this world right now. So be of good cheer, first and foremost. Be happy, be safe. But above all, at the end of the day, even while you're with your family, you will still have to confront the evils of this world. And this is the reminder. Every single person around you is your brother and sister in this reality. Every single human. This is why, therefore, for the Christian, there can be no limit as to who their neighbor is. Because every single human on this earth is your brother and sister. And on that note, so everyone have a great Thanksgiving and holiday season. God bless and stay safe.